Our first speaker is Robert Stoinich. He's from Atlas ML, and Atlas ML is all about um, democratizing machine learning in the open source community. He also runs something called Papers with Code, which is taking a data-driven approach to seeing what is hot at the moment in machine learning. So this will be a really good opening presentation. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. Awesome. Um, thank you very much for everyone who came here on this horrible day uh, and who is withstanding the cold and the damp and everything. Um, um, hopefully, it's going to be useful for you guys. All right. So my name is Robert. I'm the CEO of Atlas ML. And we created this website, Papers with Code, essentially to be able to keep up with ML. So what is the problem with keeping up with ML? Well, every day there's like 100 uh, papers published. There's uh, probably as many GitHub repositories out there. There's just this constant avalanche of information about new methods, new results, new this, new that. Um, so sometime um, last year, in, in July, we created this website where essentially we said, well, we want to know what are the current papers that the community is talking about, and we only want to focus on papers that actually have code implementation, so there's something to try. It's not just uh, um, uh, something that you know, people have claimed that they've done. Um, so we kind of automatically link those and we present them in a kind of a, in a trending page. So if you go to papersweekcode.com, this is going to look differently because it's a screenshot from last week. Um, and that kind of uh, lets you monitor what happens with the latest uh, research. But that wasn't enough. So another problem we found when we tried to keep up with machine learning is we never really knew like what's the best method for a specific thing, because there's always new results coming out. Even if, you know, even when I went to a researcher and asked them, like, what's the current state of the art in semantic segmentation, they'd be like, oh, yeah, I heard about this paper, but I'm not sure, and so on. So essentially what we've done then in February this year is we created the biggest database of uh, machine learning leaderboards, tasks, data sets, and papers with code. So essentially, um, we, we have all of this information in one place, uh, so you can more easily track um, uh, 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 progress in machine learning. So for instance, if I'm interested in computer vision and I'm interested in semantic segmentation, I can click on that card there. That will lead me a page that looks like this. That will give me a brief description of what semantic segmentation is. Um, and then it's going to give me all the different data sets that people use for semantic segmentation. It will give me what's the current, currently the best method on each of these different data sets and will directly link me to the paper and to the code. If I want to uh, go even a bit further, uh, for instance, I'm specifically interested in the Pascal context data set, I can click on that and get a graph that looks like this. Um, so this is showing me how uh, the green line is the state of the art, how it evolved over time. And this is showing me how we made, as a community, progress over time on this specific benchmark. So if you were a researcher, you might want to understand what are these sudden jumps, what were the insights that enabled them. And if you're a practitioner, you might want to look uh, at a couple of best methods and see how they perform on your data set, or if there are any ideas that you can use from there. And once again, for each of these, you get links to papers uh, and to code to try them out. So this is papers we code right now. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the data aggregation is uh, automated. However, sprinkled around the website, there are also edit buttons. Um, so if you find an error or there is a result that hasn't been included, maybe it's your result, someone else's result, you can go in and edit it. We made editing completely open to the community. Um, and, and don't worry, everything is versioned. So uh, you know, don't worry about adding stuff. Um, uh, we also have a pretty big community um, on Slack and, and, and otherwise of people uh, who add results, who review them, and so on. And we are, we are uh, entirely indebted with this community in kind of uh, keeping this up. All the data is open source. So if you go on here in About, um, you can download all the data. It's CC by, CC by SA. So just like Wikipedia, you can use it for whatever purpose you want as long as you credit us. So essentially, with this website, we want to just, just kind of um, bring together this information and make sure this information is accessible for everyone. All right. So now, um, in the second half, I wanted to tell you about uh, some of the insights from the data that we got. So first of all, uh, you might want to know what are the three most popular papers we code in this year so far. Number three, GANs. 
So here is a work from a group in Korea. So you can take a bald person, draw in some, col some colorful hair, uh, and then this is going to in-paint the actual hair. And you can see multiple examples of that. Two and a half thousand stars on GitHub. That's number three. Number two, GANs. Uh, so what we're doing here is, um, uh, is kind of sketch to image synthesis. So you can draw your sketch of the type of thing that you want synthesized. Uh, and then uh, the GAN is essentially take, going to take your sketch. So here there was no shore, and we drew a shore, and then it's going to in-paint a, a shore there. Four and a half thousand stars in GitHub. So what's going to be number one? Not GANs, e something even more dangerous, and that's GPT-2. So this is a work from OpenAI, um, 6,000 stars. Um, made it to, um, uh, to The Guardian as well. Um, so the code for this is actually available. So you can get the code, uh, and you can play around with it. The smaller models are also available. Um, uh, they just haven't released the very big model, uh, the very big language model uh, that essentially uh, uh, breaks the state of the art in, in various uh, uh, benchmarks by essentially kind of using more data than everyone else. However, there is some chatter on social media that somebody has reproduced the biggest model and they're going to release it soon. So we'll see whether uh, these types of predictions are going to come through or not once they release it. And you might also want to know, well, you know, given this whole open AI thing, like, is the community actually getting more open or less open? Like, are we going as a community in the right direction? And I have some good news for you. And that is, so if we look at the percentage of machine learning papers that have code over time, that percentage in 2013 was just under 3%. And now, last year, it was more than 15%. So as a community, I think we're definitely going in the right direction. Obviously, we're still off 100%, uh, where I think we should be, that every, every paper has some sort of code, some, something that you can try out, um, and all the kind of data and models are published with it. But I think we're going in the, in the right direction. And our mission as, uh, as Atlas ML is to kind of help that further, accelerate that, uh, those developments. Um, you know, Papers We Code is just the first thing we build, and we are going to um, you know, uh, release a bunch of new stuff. So if you want to be up to date with what's going, going on, you can follow myself on Twitter on Papers We Code to see also what are the latest uh, and interesting uh, sort of papers. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for that, Robert. Next up, we've got Jane Wong from DeepMind. She's a senior research scientist there uh, and with a background in computational and cognitive neuroscience, um, which will make perfect sense when you hear her talk about causality. Thank you, Jane. Um, all right, thank you very much, uh, Libby, and to the organizers for uh, inviting me here today. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking today about meta-learning causality in humans and AI. Um, now, artificial intelligence, as we all know, has yielded some pretty impressive advancements in recent years. But one way in which it still lags the way that humans um, are intelligent is in ab abstract and causal reasoning. So that's why I'm talking about this today. Um, and why is, is this important? Well, um, in the real world, you, we actually, um, we're able to learn much faster if we have a notion of uh, what are called priors. So if we are able to uh, learn from, from our past experience and apply it to our current situation. So for instance, I can take my knowledge of physics or temporal continuity and apply it to um, if I'm learning a new softball game or, or something, for instance. So, um, oh, uh, I got cut off a little bit here, but um, so the even more, uh, useful are uh, causal priors. Um, these are just if you have, uh, if you know about relationships in terms of cause and effect. And having a notion of um, causality is important because in um, the real world, which is very interactive, um, and uh, in which my own actions can actually cause uh, effects on the world around me, it's very um, useful to be able to have 
a notion of, um, a, a be able to model those cause-effect relationships. And that can help us um, to essentially uh, have faster adaptation and control, uh, exploration, planning, and also experimentation. So in general, it just essentially makes everything a lot easier. All right, so, um, and, and this is why it's such a fundamental part of uh, human intelligence. Um, and this is important for uh, also two reasons. The first is that causality is, um, is essentially automatic. It's something that we just do without really thinking about it. And so here's an example that I'm gonna give you. Um, this is me sitting at my desk, maybe at night. Um, this has happened to me before where the door just kind of opens uh, as if by itself. And uh, it, it looks really creepy just like opening by itself. And um, I could actually get scared because uh, maybe I think that my house is haunted and, um, and you know, I, I have a paranormal activity situation here, um, but I don't. Uh, and the reason is that I, I have a cat and I just know pretty automatically that I don't have anything to be alarmed about because he's learned how to open the door um, even though I can't see him. Uh, I can make that inference automatically that my cat caused the door to open. Another reason why this might be important, um, having causal reasoning, is that it's useful for making important decisions. Um, for instance, in the medical industry. So uh, say that I'm a medical doctor, which um, I'm not, but uh, so uh, take all these with a grain of salt, what I'm about to say, but if I were a medical doctor and uh, I have a patient who has high cholesterol, then I might think about um, giving them drug A, knowing that drug A lowers cholesterol. But I also uh, know that drug A can um, reduce clotting, the ability to do clotting. Drug B increases clotting, but it also increases blood pressure, which has um, subsequent effects on the first two. So this is quite a complex uh, system of interactions here. But if I had access to, um, to all of these, uh, these connections here, then I should be able to make a good decision about the drugs to, um, to uh, prescribe. Now, I've presented it this way because this is what's called a uh, causal graph or a causal uh, network. And it's essentially a shorthand. It's an it's a easy way for us to visualize all the complex interdependencies that exist in this system and allows us to reason about um, and to draw conclusions about you know, decisions that we can make in the situation. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of uh, formal tools and algorithms that have been developed to make explicit use of such causal graphs. So uh, a simple version of this is, the simplest version really, is just this um, two node causal graph here, where you um, have, where the nodes are representing variables, which are essentially um, things that you can measure in your environment. So for instance, um, B could be cholesterol and A could be my diet. And so um, essentially I can, I can observe these variable values and th something called a conditional dependency and then I can um, infer the existence of these arrows. I can't directly observe the arrows, the causal relationships, but I can make an inference based on these uh, observations. And conditional dependencies are just, um, for example, if I know that when I observe A, I always observe B, but if I observe B, then I don't always observe A, it's like 50% or something, then I, ha I, I can say with more confidence that maybe the arrow of causality goes from A to B and not the other way. So there's a lot more kind of um, sophisticated ways that you can derive causal relationships and much more causal, uh, complex causal relationships and causal graphs um, from just observing these, um, these conditional dependencies um, and frequencies. But um, there's a lot of situations in which observation alone isn't enough. And that's when you have, uh, one of your variables is unobserved. So it's hidden, right? Like, so for instance, if um, there was some factor underlying like illness in my patient that is causing um, the high cholesterol and I don't observe that, then that's gonna lead me to erroneous conclusions as to um, the, the causal um, relationships. And in that case, what you have to do is you have to make what's called an intervention. And all an intervention does is it um, assets one of the yeah, this laser isn't working. It sets one of the nodes to uh, a specific value and it disconnects it from, um, from all of the nodes that are pointing to it. And this makes it a lot easier to be able to reason about the, um, the directionality and the weights of the subsequent arrows coming from this particular node, particularly if you compare it to if I don't intervene on that node um, and, and, or if I intervene on a different node. So uh, the popular version of this, uh, which you might have heard of, is a randomized controlled trial. 
which is of course used a lot in medicine, in pharmacology, and sort of the gold standard in terms of trying to understand causal relationships. Um, but of course, you know, humans are not conducting randomized controlled trials uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to make decisions and to understand causality. So that leads um, to the next part of my talk, which is uh, how does causality develop in humans? Um, so when does it show up? Is it something that exists from the time that we're born? Is it something that develops with um, experience? So uh, to kind of foreshadow a little bit, uh, spoil it a little bit, I'm gonna answer, or I'm gonna show you some evidence that demonstrates that this is actually um, both, a bit of both. Uh, so it not only develops uh, along a set tr developmental trajectory, but it also uh, later on in life, it starts to become more and more influenced by experience and by the kind of environment that we're inhabiting. And, um, and so it's, it's sort of our like uh, veering off of this set trajectory a bit. So starting from the beginning, uh, from a baby, essentially, um, all the, uh, we know a lot about what babies can and cannot do. It's been, they've been studied a lot. Um, but what's relevant for causality is that it essentially seems like they don't demonstrate causal knowledge. They have rudimentary senses of uh, physics, of objects, um, and even numbers, but they don't seem to have notions of causality. Uh, now, two-year-olds, on the other hand, can learn to predict simple causal or predictive relationships essentially between two events. Um, so so pr pretty simple relationships. And they can't spontaneously make interventions based on causal understanding. They can't try to change something in the world in order to get more causal knowledge. Um, by the time we're three or four years old, we can start to infer more complicated causal graphs from just observing them. And uh, we can even infer unobserved causes. So like that example earlier with my cat. Um, I'm not able to see my cat, but I can infer that it caused the, the door to open nevertheless. So they can start doing these kinds of things, um, consistent with a more uh, uh, optimal sort of Bayes net formalism. Um, at four to five, we can start to make informative and uh, targeted interventions based on causal knowledge. So now this is where we, we can uh, actively seek out information in the environment to develop uh, causal knowledge. Um, and interestingly enough, they've been, sh uh, we've uh, they have been shown to, in certain situations, actually perform, um, be able to learn causal relationships that are more complicated than adults. So um, Alison Gopnik and her lab have done really wonderful work in this, um, where they essentially are putting both children and adults in situations where, from the data, the correct um, inference to make is this more complicated causal um, conclusion. But uh, nevertheless, adults tend to not come to that conclusion. Adults tend to um, infer that it's a simpler relationship than it really is. And, um, and that's because adults tend to have pretty strong priors for simpler causal relationships. And as you'll see, um, this prior tends to be more useful over a wider variety of situations. Children don't have these priors just yet, and that's why they can uh, essentially do better in these situations. Um, adolescents are starting to develop uh, more uh, strategies for causal learning in a way uh, such that the, uh, there's more individual variability. So you can start to see differences from person to person um, evidencing the influence of experience. And there's also evidence for um, certain biases that start to show up. And when I say biases, I just mean deviations from what an optimal agent would do. Um, so I'm not gonna get into the details about this particular bias called the associative bias, um, but essentially what's important to note is that um, an optimal uh, model, so something that uh, kind of is able to do the best that you can do in this given situation, would make predictions um, indicated by these solid lines here, whereas humans are making predictions according to the dotted line. So you can see this like deviations from what is optimal. Um, and so overall, you can, uh, just to sum up really quick, we, we see that children um, are developing in a pretty set developmental trajectory from the time that we're born. Um, and developing increasingly optimal causal reasoning from observations. At the same time, at, when we get older, we are starting to be able to perform uh, causal interventions and actively seeking in, um, information. And this is exhibiting with individual variability and the increased influence of, um, of past experience and priors, and uh, also manifesting these ap apparent deviations from optimality. So I'm, I wanna get into a little bit here, what are the reasons for these deviations from optimality? Um, 
And when I say these deviations, again, it, this is deviating from uh, what the um, optimal sort of, uh, or formally speaking, optimal um, agent would predict. And these formal approaches of causal reasoning are actually um, typically tend to optimize for specific situations. So assen essentially they're relying on specific assumptions. You know that the model class is um, perhaps a certain way and that it's not changing, for instance. Now humans do not optimize for this. They don't um, optimize for a specific causal graph, but rather the real world. And one thing we know about the real world is that it's very dynamic, it's constantly changing, and we can't know for sure what the underlying causal graph is. There's a lot, lot of uncertainty over its form, as well as um, over the relevant variables um, that are involved. And so essentially what we have to do is we have to learn a set of useful priors from uh, experiencing this, this world, essentially. And uh, we also have to operate under constraints of bounded rationality, um, limited time, so I can't spend forever making a decision. Uh, I have to really be able to do it quickly. And so under these situations, perhaps, uh, you know, with dynamic environments, perhaps these uh, apparently optimal and irrational approaches are not really optimal. Um, and that uh, given these source constraints, maybe, maybe um, humans are more optimal. So, um, but of course, these un the universe is also not completely random. The universe is structured. Um, and so then what is useful for this set of uh, structured tasks that, that we, we are encountering on a day-to-day -day basis is to have structured priors. And having a notion of um, a universe of structured tasks from, from which, uh, on which we're training is actually the exact um, setup for uh, the next topic I'll be talking about, which is meta-learning. And this is now gonna be relating more to machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, because meta-learning is a topic that has, uh, was introduced in the 90s, but has in recent years become very, very popular. Um, this is just a small slice of the amount of work that's being done in it right now. Uh, and everybody seems to have a slightly different perspective as to what meta-learning is. Um, to me, the commonality amongst uh, all of these frameworks is that you essentially have these two uh, nested loops of learning, where the outer loop is um, trying to learn these priors that are useful such that on the inner loop you're learning much more quickly. And the inner loop is learning task specifics. Um, whereas the outer loop is learning over a t distribution of tasks. It's learning that structure. So, um, so yeah, so the next part of my talk, I'm gonna talk about how, a can AI learn causality in ways similar to humans through this meta-learning framework? Um, the, the inner loop that I talked about earlier is, um, is uh, th this is what it looks like in, a in our machine learning setup. Um, we have reinforcement learning on both the inner and the outer loop. And reinforcement learning just means that we're learning from re reward. Um, so the environment is going to be passing to the agent an observation and a reward every time step, and the agent is also passing back an action and is trying to just get as much reward as it can. We use a uh, recurrent neural network, deep neural network, called an LSTM, um, and all that's important to, uh, to note is that it's uh, able, able to integrate over a past history of observations and rewards and, um, and its own actions. And it's able to pass on this hidden state that is um, essentially serving as a memory somewhat. Um, now the agent itself is, um, is de parameterized essentially, it, it, it's determined by these weights uh, theta which are tuned by this outer loop of learning. So the, the weights theta are essentially operating as the priors um, that help it to learn more quickly on the inner loop. And, um, and this is all being optimized using something called policy gradient, um, where it's trying to maximize for the, uh, the total amount of reward. And of course, um, a key part of this is that an, on every um, episode, so an episode is just a, a limited number of steps of interaction with the environment, uh, every episode we're, we're sampling a different task from this distribution of environments. This is just that universe of tasks that I was discussing earlier, um, where there's structure. And so the question we want to ask is, in this setup, can, can we get our, um, our meta-RL agent, essentially, which is what I'm going to call it, can we get it to learn causal priors? Um, so, so if we want to, uh, so, so the question that we want to ask is, given different types of experience, 
can the same architecture, the same like meta RL architecture that I showed you earlier, um, learn to use information to display causal knowledge at different levels? So um, in other words, essentially uh, anal analogous to this would be if I were to try to train three different humans where for the entire lifetime, each of those humans is getting a different kind of an experience for their entire lives. And I want to see um, how well they can perform causal reasoning and at what levels it can operate. Um, if, if this is true that, um, that in meta-learning, our agents can learn these useful structured priors, um, then being able to get past it different types of experience and then measuring how well it can do is a good way to test this. All right, so, um, so really quickly, I'm just gonna go through an example episode. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention that uh, the three types of uh, experience we give it are if it's just learning from pure observation alone, or if it's learning from interventional information where it can intervene on these graphs, and also um, having access to noise information, which I'll explain in a little bit. So um, in this particular, uh, in, in, the, in, in the interventional um, experience uh, agent, um, this is a, gonna be an example episode. And uh, what we do is we have five nodes in our causal graph, and we sample them randomly, such that we are randomizing the, the arrows between them. Um, the agent can only observe the values of the nodes and not the arrows, um, and except for the hidden node, so it can't observe that fifth uh, node value at all. Um, and for four time steps, it's able to select any one of the nodes to intervene on and then look at the um, uh, observed values. And, and uh, on the fifth time step, then we're testing it by um, passing a, a previously unobserved event um, so we're setting this node now to an unseen value, uh, previously unseen value, and then asking the agent to pick the one that's the highest value. Um, and this is actually quite difficult to do if you, uh, because of the limited amount of information, because the agent is only test able to do, um, take four observations before it's tested on this graph it has never seen before. Um, and there is a, um, gonna be random noise that's, that's added at every time step. So, um, so just getting to the results. Now, in order to be able to interpret the results, I have to compare two different baselines. So essentially asking, um, what is the best that I can do given um, this amount of information? So the optimal associative baseline is how well I can do if I only know asso uh, associative and not causal information. If I'm not taking into account causality at all, but I just know that things happen together, that's how well I can do. I'm normalizing everything to uh, how the best I can do if I know the true underlying causal graph. And um, this is how well an agent does if they have been trained on only observational data. So you can see that they're doing better than the uh, optimal associative, meaning that they're able to make some kind of causal inference from just observational data. Given interventions though, um, it, they can do almost as well as essentially having access to the ground truth causal graph. Now I'm just gonna copy this over and, and, and shift the, the x-axis because um, I wanna compare it to an optimal counterfactual agent. This is an agent that has access to the noise. So um, in any given situation, there's gonna be noise. There's gonna be things you can't account for. If I can rewind time and think back to, oh, if, um, if only I had done that in that particular situation, then I can do much better than if I just know the underlying causal graph. And that's what this baseline is. And, our ac uh, and ha giving our agents access to that noise information allows it to do better than before, essentially. So I'm running out of time now, so I'm just gonna um, flash up these takeaways and uh, say thank you very much to my collaborators and colleagues, especially Ishida Dasgupta, who led on the work that I, um, I talked about here. And uh, thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> So that was wonderful. We've got one more talk before we move on to the panel, and this is Peter Coyle. He is founder of a, a, an AI startup called, um, let me get this right, Aphlorismic Labs. Uh, they do hyper-personalized bespoke <laughs> podcasts. Now that sounds absolutely fascinating to me, but that's not what he's talking about today. He also um, spends a lot of time as a core contributor to a library called PyMC3, which is a probabilistic programming library. Um, so he's going to talk about that now, and I suggest that we try and flag him down after this session to talk about the bespoke podcasts. Welcome to the stage. Thank you, thank you very much. This is beautiful British weather, so thank you very much for coming into a tent. 
Um, uh, I won't keep you too long. Uh, I this will probably be under the 20 minutes, but um, this is myself, this is Patrick Coyle, um, not talking about podcasts. Uh, this is me on the internet. Um, if you want to learn more about probabilistic programming, um, if it, this interests you, there is a course that I happen to run. London's expensive. Uh, help a poor entrepreneur out. So just uh, a little bit, bit, bit about one of my open source contributions, PyMC3. We recently released um, 3.7, our recent release. Um, it's Python 3 only. We finally got caught up with uh, current uh, reality. We use RV's um, devs uh, for plotting. We've got a really nice data class, and there's a lot of like under the hood improvements, which you won't really notice, but they make things a lot easier to, uh, to adopt. Uh, that's the kind of link there. So what is this? Why does it matter? Um, so uncertainty is everywhere in the world, as, you know, as James already talked about. You know, you know, we, we deal with uncertainty. The predicting the future is hard, as everyone who ever tried to do sports betting has discovered. And if anyone's ever seen one talk by me, you'll know all about that. So there's a lot of small data problems in, in the world. There's surveys, there's A-B testing, there's et cetera, et cetera. And um, this is the kind of thing that we, we would like to do. But, and while building Bayesian methods can be hard, it can be also really hard to build a deep learning model. I'm very, very anti-deep learning. I, you know, I jumped over that bandwagon a long time ago. So, so isn't everything a machine learning problem? This is the one of the first things you discover when you like, become a senior data scientist and you have a junior data scientist and they get very excited and they sort of run away and they go to papers uh, with code.com and they come back and they think, oh, this is our solution. I have a hammer. Where's the nail, right? So, so not all problems are machine learning problems, right? So you have things like heterogeneous data. You have like, you know, your life's very complicated. Or you have small data problems. And if you throw a, a random forest or an XG boost at that, you'll get substandard results. So, you know, this is kind of, you know, this is the hill that I will die on. Um, so one of the questions is, what is the applications? Why does anyone care? Is this just industry? You know, we live in a capitalist society for good or ill. Um, but anywhere you want to understand uncertainty. So I did a survey on this, and like 80% of use cases of PyMC3 in the wild were like A-B testing. About 15% were like things like risk modeling or financial modeling. You know, so if you have like capital to allocate, you want to allocate it in an efficient manner. Um, there's other things like price modeling. So the common trend with this, you know, the thread that links these together, is that you have a lot of uncertainty. Uncertainty is a key thing that you care about here. So that is what's called a probabilistic programming language. Um, I think when I started working on this a few years ago, there weren't very many, but um, now there's loads. Um, this slide is out of date. This is the best part about modern day innovation. You've got Pyro from Uber, which is an excellent uh, library based on PyTorch. You've got PyMC3, which I have no opinion on publicly whatsoever. <laughs> You've got Stan, which is, um, which is a domain specific language written on C++, but I think they're moving to OCaml. And, um, and it's really like got a really advanced kind of like community. Um, I think from an adoption point of view, it's relatively complicated. Um, you've got Edward, which was written by um, Dustin Tran. I think there's an Edward too now. I've, I have trouble keeping up with him. And there's Rainier, which is by my friend Avi Briant. It's in the Scala community. He's a Stripe. They're applying these things to things like um, you know, uh, identity modeling, you know, trying to predict if someone is fraudulent or not given whatever priors you have about their previous behavior. So one of the questions is, who is actually using this in the wild, right? So this is um, a slide I'm going to regret putting up. But um, <laughs> this is who uses Stan. This is probably out of date as well. You've, you've, got people like, you've got people like Google. You've got Facebook. Facebook used Stan for their profit modeling, for their time series modeling um, applications, which is a really good paper by Sean uh, Taylor and a few others. Um, you've got like, insurance, you know, like the Barnick Wallingham's using it, Argo, who's not a reinsurance or a player, Amazon's using it, a buyer. You've got, you know, and you've got, you notice a lot of these are in regulatory environments where like explainability is really important. And this is going to come up later on, probably on the panel. How do we explain AI and how do we explain you know, statistical models and various other ones, uh, generable, etc. And who uses PyMC3? This is a much more interesting slide. Um, no bias whatsoever. Um, you got Google, Stripe use a bit of it, um, Salesforce, various other ones, Quintopian, Thomas Vecchi, 
and Adrian, who are two, some of my core contributors, PyMC3 or Quantopian, they use it for modeling portfolios. So Quantopian is like a, a platform for doing um, financial trading and you know, learning about how to do uh, quantitative finance. Um, they have a lot of applications there. So you kind of got like a moderate, we've sort of like touched on this earlier on, but like you, you have this is what a modern Bayesian workflow is. You'll notice a difference between this and a machine learning mo uh, workflow. Here you're using your criticism to improve your model, whereas in a uh, machine learning model, you're often trying to optimize for a particular you know, objective function that you've already decided in, in, in the future, uh, beforehand. So um, one of the questions is what's coming next? There is gonna be a pi MC4. Um, everything has to go up by a number. Um, we had a summit recently in Montreal, um, which was gr some great support from the TensorFlow probability team at Google. So I'm very glad to see this um, support of the open source community because I've never been paid to write any of this code. Um, and so it's a really important thing, I think, as we move forward. Um, next generation PPLs will be able to use things like TPUs and next generation hardware, which is something I know nothing about, but is very interesting. And you can have a look there. Um, if you're interested, um, I wrote an analysis piece where like, it was quite a high level piece where I interviewed a number of stakeholders about how they're using PPLs. It's got like a lot of interesting insights there. It's a, a data set that I haven't found anywhere else in the world. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it myself. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for listening to my talk. Thank you, Peter. Stay here, stay here. I'll stay here. Um, and I'm going to invite Jane and Robert back up on the stage as well and take a seat. No, that's fine. Thank you. So I think we've got about 20, 25 minutes to um, have a little bit of a jog through questions of re research frontiers. Um, all of the panelists have kindly said that they're happy to stay behind afterwards to take questions from the audience as well. So if I don't cover a burning question now, you will have your chance. I'm going to start really generally, and then maybe we can drill down. Um, but I wanted each of you to talk about some research. Well, talk about in the last year, what is the best research you've seen? What is the worst and why? So who would like to start? Absolute silence. I'm going to go for a quick one. Um, best research. Um, so we know what's most popular. So GPT-2 is definitely most popular. Um, I actually like all this meta-learning stuff and transfer learning stuff. I love all of this uh, um, work from um, um, Ferenc Hustad and from Ruder and so on. I think all of this stuff is super, super interesting. and. In my mind, that's going to be a future, like where, like uh, that's the future I would like to see, where you get the model, you kind of tune it a bit, and it kind of, with a couple of examples, it does what it should be doing. Um, and I think once that happens, that's really going to revolutionize everything. So uh, everything that moves in that direction, I find super mega interesting. Um, uh, what's the worst? Uh, I don't know. I can't really comment on that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think everything is useful, yeah. Um, yeah, so for the best, uh, I was actually also going to say, like, the GPT-2 and the GAN stuff, which I think have just made it, I mean, I, I think that they're very impressive, and they're going to be impactful, and I can't say necessarily whether that's going to be a good or a bad kind of an impact, but they're definitely very impactful. Um, for the work that I think shouldn't have been done, it's, it's, it's more like a general class of work um, that I think is AI work that helps to perpetuate discrimination or inequality. Um, there's a couple of examples of this. I'm not going to name names, but there are ones that are trying to, for instance, classify um, sexuality or cr criminality based on just faces or work that's um, increasing surveillance increasing like basically power imbalances. I think that th this kind of work is being undertaken and it really needs to be scrutinized. It needs to be kind of um, operating or being done with the permission of all those that are going to be impacted by it. Thank you. Perhaps we'll come back to that question actually, but let's let Peter answer this question. And I want a worst one as well. 
Yeah, can't really argue with that. Um, so um, I find it ironic, um, you know, a comp you know, people who work for an ad tech-based company complaining about surveillance. But we'll we'll move past that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I work for DeepMind, not Google. So. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, you know, definitely the discriminatory um, kind of bias stuff. Some of the um, kind of fake news kind of stuff, I think, was um, a bit um, misjudged. In terms of the best stuff I've seen, um, I'd probably go with the same answer, like GPT-2. Um, there's been a lot of really interesting stuff in probabilistic programming, like in the variation inference stuff, to allow things to scale to a l larger data sets. I can't think of any paper off the top of my head. Thank you. So um, I'm going to stick a little bit with um, questions of fairness and ethics. This isn't, isn't the ethics stage, as you know, but we, it's worth spending a little bit of time on. Um, do you think that the ethical challenges uh, for sustainable progress in AI are dwarf the technical ones, and is enough attention being shown to them? So I think one of the interesting things, I think Benedict Evans, who's at A16Z, said this, that when you talk to the man in the street, the thing they worry about is self-driving cars. Like, I'm very bearish on self-driving cars. No disrespect to anyone who's at Oxbotica or anyone like that in the audience. but. Um, but I'm very concerned about things like bias. And I think we don't do enough to talk about, you know, like how powerful some of these things are and how we even think about how our data collection process is. Because often the people will say the algorithm is biased, but it's actually the data collection in the first place was biased by whatever structural factors were there in the first place. So I think it's very important to think of these things. You know, tech is changing the world. If we want to like take part in this, we should, you know, you know, develop some responsibility, you know, and consider these things really important, you know, in how we think about things like ethical frameworks. And there's been a lot of really good work on that. I think we have more to do, but we're going in the right direction. Yeah, so I think uh, there's a couple of issues there. I think I'll re separate two things. So one is like how open the community is, which I think is very important because, um, you know, if, if you get too much concentration of knowledge, data, computes, models, and so on in, in, in like one place, um, that just like lends itself to abuse in like any kind of totalitarian system and so on. So I think, you know, the, the reason, you know, why, you know, why, why we do our stuff is because we kind of care about this. Um, so I think, so one is like um, concentration of power, which I think at this point is concentrated because for like ML, you need lots of, like, you need to invest lots of money, you need lots of CPU time and so on. It's not like Linux that you can just, like, you know, like, hack around and just create Linux, right? You can't just hack around and create a AlphaGo, you know, like, you need loads of money. So, uh, so I think there is a concentration of power, and I think as a community, we need to kind of push back and make sure things remain open and uh, are, s are still open. In terms of, like, bias, ethics, and so on, everything humans do has ethical concerns with it. Um, and I think, um, in my mind, the right uh, way forward is changing incentives. So uh, one thing we so we had a collaboration with somebody else, and we were looking at like uh, number of GitHub stars for repositories that specifically look at bias, ethics, and so on. Nothing, you know, like they get like hundred stars, fifty stars, you know, and some GAN get like thousands of stars. So I think, um, you know. Until like regulation and incentives change, I think um, you know these these problems can't really be changed. So I think yeah, we need to change regulation. Uh, that's my opinion at least. Um, yeah, I mean I think that absolutely this is something that should be almost like one of the most important things that we're thinking about when we're doing research. I think that right now um, a lot of research is being done like kind of in these siloed uh, situations where we do not have to deal with the impact of, um, of this work and uh, or the technologies that can be created from it. Um, and I absolutely think that the incentives are, are kind of set up a little bit um, incorrectly right now. I don't know what the solution to that would be, but uh, anything that can sort of tie together doing research with thinking also about how that research is gonna impact um, those that, it, you know, like those in the world, 
where you know AI is going to be everywhere. It, it is everywhere, um, and so we need to have people working on this uh, that are representative or can be representative of of those people that it's going to be impacting. And one way we can do this is by ensuring that you have a, a greater diversity of backgrounds um, in the people that are doing research in this. Um, and so, and, and basically always having an ethical charter or thinking about ethics um, at any research company that you're at or in, in academia as well. Thank you, couldn't agree more uh, with that. Um, but let's stick then with open source. So. Um, Deep learning has progressed in an unprecedentedly open way um, over the last few years since 2012. Um, as soon as cutting edge research um, is done, it seems to be available. And yet there seems to be an army of uh, volunteers like yourselves who are making software um, open source and maintaining it. What, what is the role of the open source community going forwards and how, is it, how can it be sustained? I'm looking at you, Robert. <laughs> um, I mean, so, so open source is, uh, in my mind, super, um, super important because it, it's the common common infrastructure we all use, and like without it, like n like none of it that you see around us essentially would exist. Um, and uh, you know, in my previous life, uh, I, I was actually you know, one of the early developers of Wikipedia as well, and I was also like kind of open sourcing knowledge. So I think that was also, uh, you know, I think super super important. Um, I think, um, yeah. So, so GitHub, for instance, has this new thing where like trying now, you know, like if you see a dependency, that they're like, you know, you can um, put up some money and then they will pay people and so on. Um, I hope that's going to work. I think if anybody's going to make that work, like actually funding people who write code, um, they're going to make it work. Um, but I mean, other people have tried before and you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it, it didn't work. Um, yeah, I think how we think about it as a company is essentially, uh, we want to make something that's useful for the community. Uh, we want to make something uh, that's useful for everyone. And we think that companies are part of everyone. So essentially, there are certain things that only companies need to do. Um, and, um, and, and kind of this is kind of how, kind of how we can make it uh, sustainable. So essentially, have an open source arm that does lots of uh, kind of work common for everyone. And then have a kind of enterprise arm that essentially um, makes the whole thing sustainable. So. But we're still figuring out. So it's not very. It's we're a small startup. We're trying to figure out how how can we make this work. But uh, hopefully we will. Yeah. Yeah. So I pretty much uh, echo a lot of Rob's um, comments. You know, like the GitHub stuff. I'm really, really excited about. Um, the advantage they probably have now is, you know, Microsoft's been very supportive of open source community um, over the last year, which is words I didn't expect to say in my career, actually. So just to take a step back, I've just said that Microsoft has been very supportive of the open source community. You know, something that under Balmer wouldn't have been possible at all, um, or previous uh, leaders. So, um, you know, and there's been tremendous reach and, you know, Nat Friedman, who's our CEO of GitHub, has been really, like, positive about it and there's, like, you know, been a lot of integration. But I still think that we're very naive about this, right? So, you know, there was a really good um, article called Roads and Bridges, um, which talks about, um, I forget the, the author's name, it talks about, like, the underlying infrastructure of our digital age and, you know, where these contributions come from and the fact that most of these people are unpaid and, you know, and we only discover these things when we have security leaks, when we discover, for example, I think last year there was an actual hack on Node.js code by someone basically cheating his way into the community and putting like a, like a kind of like security backdoor. You know, so like these are, are becoming better, you know, bigger concerns. If you're not, if you run a company, if you're a manager, look at like getting involved and in doing some sort of open source like contributions. You know, there's various like um, uh, NumFocus, who's very involved with the PyMC3, is very supportive and allows these things to be tax deductible. Um, so there are there are stuff out there. So, uh, but I think we are depending too much on something that might bite us in in the long run. So, thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about probabilistic programming a bit more. Um, and in particular, one of the themes that has come up again and again today has been the requirement to have some sort of explanation for machine learning models. 
Um, in what way does being able to better model uncertainty help with that, if it does? So I think it's very context specific. So I think a lot depends on like what discipline you're in. You know, I don't think any of these things are one. You know, they don't solve all problems. Um, there was research where in the medical community we care more about accuracy and less about explainability, whereas in fina finance we care more about explainability. So you know, the, the, there seems to be a natural divide there. Um, you know, probabilistic programming allows you know better understanding of uncertainty, and that allows a certain element of incorporating prior understanding so that can be quite helpful but you know although i'm very fond of these methods i don't think they are the one size fits all and i think that's one thing very important for our community is how we allow multiple like threads you know multiple uh, attacks on different problems okay let's move on i don't know whether jane you'll be able to address this in a couple of minutes but um you were talking about learning priors, and there's been a bit of a um, discussion in the community generally about what, what what should be learned and what should just be incorporated. Could you discuss that a little bit, please? Uh, yes. So this was um, this is something that actually came out at iClear, where um, I was with Libby uh, talking about it as well. Um, it, so this relates to Rich Sutton's uh, recent manifesto. I don't know if people have seen this, um, talking about how uh, basically deep learning models ha um, have been able to just learn everything. Uh, you, that any hand handcrafted knowledge that you put into them will eventually be superseded by just throwing enough data at it. Um, and so it seems seems like you, you don't actually need to um, use any any human knowledge. Um, to, to put into these systems. And I, I, I agree to that to uh, an extent um, because I think that in a lot of cases you can structure your task environments in such a way that the only way that, the, you, that your model can essentially do well on that task is to essentially learn that abstraction or that structured prior that, uh, such that it can, it can do well um, on, this, on this and related tasks. Uh, however, I think that it, it you sort of have just pushed off the problem to defining the task appropriately or to defining that task structure, which is also really difficult. So there's a lot of situations in which you might want to, um, to use a prior that's general enough, such that it's not just sort of handcrafted human knowledge, but that it's, it's really, you know that it's, it's maybe the way that a human learns, or you know that it's helpful for real systems um, that exists, uh, you know, by, you know, th that we know exists because we studied it uh, in neuroscience. Um, I think that these kinds of things are, um, they have to work because they, they do work in the real world. So I, I think that, that it's sort of, um, uh, yeah, we have to be careful about the things that we build in, um, but uh, I think that, you know, it's not like we should, we sh it should be an either or. All right, I think we've, uh, we've got about three minutes left, so I'm going to um, go back out to general again um, and ask you to think about one research question that you think will be solved in the next couple of years that's important and why. Um, Jane, would you like to start? Um, well, I don't know if this is actually going to be solved in the next couple of years, but I think it's something that um, should be solved, uh, and that's uh, being able to interpret our models, um, having interpretability. I think actu actually you mentioned something uh, about that as well. Um, and, and the reason is, is that we are starting to uh, rely more and more on these um, AI systems and models, which are governing essentially a lot of, part of parts of our lives. Um, and without being able to know why they're recommending certain things or what they're optimizing for, uh, the decisions that they make, um, it can get into a really dangerous uh, cycle of, um, of us kind of just like trusting these, these models too much. And so I think explainability, um, interpretability, and being able to ensure that it essentially buys you safety guarantees because you, you know sort of the reason your models are, um, are making certain decisions. Can you give any kind of indication of when you think that might be possible, if it's possible? So the when. When? 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 Oh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like to... Um, I know. <laughs> to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I think people are already working on this, um, actually at, at DeepMind even, uh, and I know a lot of other uh, AI uh, industry labs. And um, so I, I'm hopeful that w we'll start to see some solid progress being made towards it in the next couple of years. Um, I don't think it'll be solved in a couple of years. Um, but a, a, as I said, I think if it's not solved, then it could be quite bad. Yeah. So maybe pe more and more sort of effort will be made to solve it um, if it hasn't been solved in a couple of years. Um, so, so I largely agree with the AI safety thing. Um, I'm not going to answer that. I think I'm more in uh, another thing that I think is going to be very interesting is more better like kind of API designs, right? So currently it's actually quite difficult for researchers to write certain models in certain classes. And if we could get kind of better at our, you know, symbolic understanding of that, you know, we would like improve productivity. So, you know, there's, you know, one that I'm going to like put on. Thank you. And Robert, your thoughts? Yeah, I'm going to default back to my old answer, and that is uh, essentially anything in representation learning or transfer learning. Um, uh, yeah, if we can learn better representation of the world, I think that would be amazing. Uh, if we can interpret them, that would be even more amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to, to more research on that. Again, I'm not going to let you off that easily. <laughs> So are there any specific strands of research along those lines that you're interested in? And you know, when might they be fulfilled? Um, I don't know. So, like, so, so, so one thing that I was um, uh, reading about in, in, in representation learning is being able to untangle representations, right? So, um, and um, yeah. So um, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so essentially it's just like, so when you're, when you're learning like how, how you want to represent a person, you might tangle different things. So for instance, if I want to uh, change someone's face, it might change other parts of the physique. So we want to learn a representation where we know that this parameter just like controls the face and this parameter controls the arms and this parameter controls the... I don't know, the movements and so on, stuff like that. But when, when AIs learn representation, everything is kind of mangled. And if you ever looked at these kind of visualizations of AI stuff, everything seems kind of mangled. And it's really interesting sometimes to just like see what AI actually sees in a picture, which kind of seems quite hallucinogenic. Um, so if we could somehow kind of make that more human, I think that could maybe help with interpretability as well, because then we would know essentially what it's thinking and why is it making certain decisions. That wasn't 18 seconds, but I tried. I think you did pretty well. Um, and I think it's clear to everyone here that we've only touched the surface of Research Frontiers. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for taking part in it. I hope you'll join me in thanking our speakers today.